Hi, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kenneth Moy. I'm going to talk about asynchronous JavaScript and multi-threading in C++. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the differences in the two languages, well, three in this case. Um, JavaScript is generally a single-threaded single language. I say generally because JavaScript operates on a single thread, but within that thread, they have a pool of threads that handle events and some other asynchronous calls, but everything really occurs on a single thread, which is why it's generally known as single-threaded. There are also some new tools coming out, like Nexus.js, which have C++ on the side, which kind of help support multi-threading as well. And with Java and C++, but not exclusively these languages, they support multi-threading in more of a hardware sense. So they're able to actively use multiple cores on a CPU to do t simultaneous tasks, which so we get multi-threading that way. So I'm just gonna go over the, a few things first. First thing is concurrency. What we need to know about concurrency is it's basically several code executions happening one at a time in overlapping time periods. So with this image here, it kind of shows us what I was talking about with JavaScript before, that if you have a multi-threaded CPU, it doesn't really matter to it that much because they're still going to be using one thread at a time, and within that thread, they'll handle one thing at a time and go from there. But with par parallelism, which is what multi-threading really is, you get something like this where, let's say all those workers are CPU cores, right? They're all executing at the same time. So several executions of code are done simultaneously in an overlapping time period, which you can really see here. There's a ton of people working on it at the same time. So substitute that with cores and we get multi-threading. So they almost sound like the same thing, and that's almost true. Parallelism is concurrency, but being concurrent doesn't mean you're parallel. Um, what that basically says is, what I was saying before, that something that's single-threaded, like JavaScript, it handles one thing at a time, but it can't do them simultaneously, which is what parallelism is all about. So the first thing I want to go into with all this stuff is callback functions. So callback functions work across multiple languages, not just JavaScript, but C++ has them, Java has them, C Sharp has them. What a callback function is, is it's a function passed into a, another function, so encapsulated functions, that executes while the encapsulating function is occurring to kind of simulate working in multiple places at the same time. So like it's in this example, um, we wrapped a callback function inside of a test function. So if I call test anywhere within my execution, it will execute that callback. So whether, whether you declare it within that file or not, or like in that location, it doesn't really matter because being passed as a callback allows it to happen anywhere during your code execution. The cool thing about this is you can apply this to sync and async callback, like callbacks. So it doesn't have to be a synchronous function, which helps with things like JavaScript. You can also nest these callbacks. So if I want to do callback within callbacks, that's possible. And this, like I said, simulates working in multiple areas of code at the same time. A uh, big con with this, though, is callback hell, which is when you do so much nesting that you basically lose track of where you are within your execution. This is something we went into early in junior phase, and we have now found different methods to cope with that. Another thing is debugging. Once again, because things become so nested, you have no idea where you are during execution, and it's pretty difficult to debug in that case. Also, getting return values out of this is very difficult as well, because you can only really do a single return um, in a higher order function as shown here. Um, returns with, from the callback will just be local to the function scope itself. So you can't really get anything other than a single return value from a function, even though there's a ton of nested callbacks inside of it. And like I said, this is cross-language. JavaScript, we patch functions in. Java, we can do templates like callables. C Sharp, we can do delegates, lambdas. And C++, we have function pointers. So like I said, callbacks can be used all kinds of languages, but they all serve the same purpose. So the first thing here, asynchronous JavaScript. So at this point, we basically do stuff like this, where we asynchronous as much as possible, like React um, Redux when we do thunk, um, just doing asynchronous calls, um, do like fs.read file, and things like that. 
The core thing we've been using, though, is promises. So a promise is an object that's used for asynchronous executions that represents a value that may be available now, in the future, or never. So that's really abstract, but to kind of break it down a bit, a promise basically has a function that gets executed and then a resolve and a reject state. The resolve and reject basically define the state and can only be set once within the promise. So if that thing we have happening inside the promise is successful, we hit the resolve path, which will give us what we want. And if it doesn't, it will hit the reject path, which basically tells us that whatever we wanted to happen failed. And something really cool with chaining, I mean, with promises that we see here is chaining, where we do dot then and dot catches. These, these basically build off of the concept that it's just, it just represents a value, and we can manipulate them in many ways. Like in the second half of this code snippet I put here, we have a p1 dot then, and then we have dot catch. So there's multiple ways to handle promises, and they're just really powerful tools. Um, so with that, though, there are a little more that we can use. Um, ES6 introduced generators that we can use in iterators. And even with ES7, which isn't really even a standard at this point, they're implementing stuff like async and await, which will do the same thing, but more native to the language. To expand a bit on what we use in JavaScript, we have the event loop. So this is also something we covered back um, in junior phase where it just refers to a step in execution that occurs after all the synchronous code happens. So the event loop is a kind of a queue where if you do something like a set timeout or you do an asynchronous call, it gets put onto the event queue. Um, so if you do a set timeout, maybe for like 100 milliseconds, it gets processed by the API, then put onto the event queue, and then after all the synchronous code runs, it will run that. Like in this example here, we run function two, which has a um, function one as a set timeout. So it puts that on the event table, waits 100 milliseconds, while the rest of function two is happening, which console logs out fn2 for us. So we see fn2 on the output. After that set timeout is done executing, we will hit the event queue. Then it will also process function one, which will show us fn1 in the output. So we get both of those. Key thing to remember, though, is even if we do a set timeout of zero milliseconds, it will still get put on the event queue or the event loop. That, it's kind of tricky there, but just remember that if something like that happens, it's not going to execute until everything synchronously is done. So it will wait until that's all done. Also, some cool things are every function in the event queue will run to completion before the next thing is handled. So one thing in the event queue will process completely first, and it doesn't block other executing code such as I.O. because it's handled like this. And like I said, there are thread pools handling all these things at the same time, so they're not overlapping. So now let's get into multi-threading. So Fry here is just seeing synchronize all over the place, and we will get into that. So the first thing about multi-threading is it lets you run multiple things simultaneously within a program. Like I said before, if you have a CPU that supports multiple cores and stuff, you can fire off a bunch of threads and have each core process things at the same time. So like in this example here, if we look at int main, which is basically the main function in C++ that gets executed, we create three threads, then we do a make call on them. So when we do, when we fire them off, they already start executing. So in these three cases, as soon as I fire off person, say thread person one make a call, this creates a thread and immediately starts processing make a call, which is seen up top. And then when I do person two, it does the same thing. Person three, it does the same thing. To go into a little more on what the make a call is though, there's something called a lock there. What a lock does is it prevents something we um, don't like in multi-threading, which is um, being un uh, thread un not, not thread safe, which means multiple threads can kind of start touching each other's threads, saying, hey, this is my stuff. No, this is my stuff. So locks prevent that from happening by locking like a data set to a thread at a time. So it gives a thread ownership of what it's dealing with at the time. And once this is done, 
you see that we do person one dot join. So what person one dot join is it waits for that thread to complete before handing it off to person two. So person one dot join there says, all right, you're doing work. We'll wait until you finish, and then uh, person two will happen. So that's how it works. They are fired simultaneously and do process simultaneously, but um, it will, this dot join will cause things to wait. So this is cool and all, but there are a lot of problems with multi-threading. So in this case, there are things called race conditions, which you can really see in this image here. So instead of saying he wants to put threads in our threads, it says compute IU in thread. So why is that happening? So there are a few things here. First thing is race conditions, where if multiple threads are accessing a single point of data, and you don't have any of those lock things I was talking about or other safeguards, threads will touch like data sets with, like whoever's there first will grab the data, process it, then whoever's second will go get it and process it, and we have no idea what the order is. So things like that can happen, and the small things such as processor cycles, right, which are milliseconds or nanoseconds at some point, that can cause a problem with threading where the incorrect piece of data touches your data first, and something even that small just ruins objects, so you need to make sure safeguards are there. Deadlocks are kind of a race condition, where if two, piece, two threads need to access the same piece of data, um, if one is holding it and never releases it, the second one will never process. So that in itself is a huge problem, and just make sure the safeguards are there once again. So. Two more things, detached threads. This is kind of like a area that we shouldn't really go into, but detached threads are threads that we're not tracking anymore. They are threads that are processing stuff, but they're just threads we don't manage, and if you accidentally fire one off that you need to access again, you're never gonna get it again. So don't do that. The last thing is the dot join, like I said, it stalls your program because it waits for a thread. And in some games, like in some things like games, if someone notices that your program's hanging up for maybe even two seconds, they're not gonna buy your game, sorry. So just to touch on a little more, that's very, um, something that we don't really talk about much, is the V8 engine. So the V8 engine does use C++ and is using Google Chrome. The funny thing is V8 is not thread safe. Even though it's written C++, C++ and implements some sort of multi-threading, it's not thread safe. V8 circumvents that by using something called the locker class. The locker class basically locks an instance of V8 that's being used on a single thread at a time. So if there's a thread accessing it, it's locked to that instance and no other instances can touch it at that time. The only way to do that is to release the locker and then the other threads can start using that again. So V8 has its own thing, but it's not truly thread safe in a sense that it's traditional to C++. So there's a lot of information regarding all this stuff. Like I, I talked about iterators, generators, um, the async and await functions for ES6, ES7. Um, C++ multi-threading is very interesting. I didn't go into things like locks, mutexes, futures, because those are just very long-winded and would exceed the time limit for this. And if you want to read more on the V8 engine, you can read that documentation on Google, because I mean, that's what's used for Chrome. And yeah, so the core takeaway here is that these two things, asynchronous JavaScript and C++, are two kind of solutions to the same problem in different languages. Um, they're not, they both have their pros and their cons, and they're interesting to read about, but there can't really be crossed a language in this case. But if you want to see how different languages handle this and how multi-threading works, I definitely recommend looking into it. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it.